My name is Matthew Levering, and it's a real privilege for me to be here today um, on Zoom, of course, with Matthew Barrett. Uh, and he's authored this wonderful book, on which I, I have an endorsement. It's called Simply Trinity. And the whole um, the subtitle is The Man Unmanipulated Father, Son, and Spirit. And so this, this book has a lot of wonderful elements in it, but today we're going, I'm going to ask him some questions and um, discuss with him, I hope, uh, his chapter on divine simplicity and on the, how God, the, the Holy Trinity, is a simple God, the, the one God. And so um, I, 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 I want to throw, um, throw the question to him in terms of, uh, as he was writing this chapter, um, there's many different elements in the chapter. I was interested uh, in how he came to uh, develop this particular line of thought. I know it's, I know he's working through a very deeply biblical reasoning, and I know that he also uses the Church Fathers and Thomas Aquinas. So I'd like I'm just going to ask you, Matthew, uh, how is it that your biblical reflections um, led you in this in this direction? Yeah. Well, first of all. Uh, it, it's really good to talk to another Matthew, uh, and especially uh, someone like yourself. I mean, you've uh, uh, you, you've you've written, of course, on this topic in so many ways. Uh, not just divine simplicity, but of course the the entire doctrine of the Trinity. And um, uh, yeah, even when I was uh, writing this book, uh, there was a number of occasions where I came back to some of your writings. Um, whether it's your work on Augustine or some of your more theological works and uh, just uh, get, gain so much insight from them. But yes, I mean, you, you've thought long and hard about this and, and this is some divine simplicity is something that clearly is uh, central. Uh, you know, I've, I've, it's a bit of a, uh, the, the title itself is not exactly the word simplicity, but it's the closest I could get, uh, simply Trinity. <laughs> so uh, those who are somewhat familiar with what divine simplicity is will maybe be able to catch on onto that if they're paying attention. Uh, when we talk about divine simplicity, though, we are referring to something well, I think Stephen Holmes said this at one point. It's almost too simple to say, forgive the pun. Uh, we are referring to something so essential, right? Uh, so basic to what it means to believe uh, that God is one. Uh, as Christians, we not only believe there is one God, but we believe this God is one. And so he's not a God who is composed uh, made up of or compounded of, of parts. Uh, he's not a God who's, who then could be divisible uh, by different parts that somehow compose his being. Rather, uh, when, and we could go on from, from there, and I, I, I'm sure you, you might have something to say about this as well, but even when we as creatures are talking about, you know, the attributes of God or the perfections of God, I mean, you've written a lot for example, on uh, attributes like love, or but whether it's love or whether it's um, holiness or righteousness or immutability, whatever we, we're referring to, it's not as if these are uh, somehow uh, parts in God that that we then tally up, you know, to put it colloquially, and uh, and 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 somehow uh, compound these parts to somehow get our our doctrine of God. Rather, we when we are referring to these per perfections, we're you know of course making these distinctions, but it's it's very healthy and appropriate to then qualify that and say, but 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 God's essence is His attributes, and His attributes is essence. Uh, uh, he is that simple, and all that to say, uh, this this divine simplicity is so crucial then, because we are in one sense trying to safeguard our God from anything that would be corruptible, anything that would corrupt him or divide him. When we refer to the doctrine of the Trinity, sometimes, I don't know what your experience has been, but mine, mine has been more of 
the common objection that sometimes gets thrown at me, uh, which is, well, we, certainly we can't believe in divine simplicity because God is Trinity. Uh, but I, as I argue in, in uh, this book, actually, uh, simplicity is crucial to a biblical and orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, we can talk about so many of the reasons why that's the case. I, I guess I, one thing I would say just from a biblical perspective is when we come to, uh, you know, a, an epistle like Paul's epistle, or both of his epistles, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we start to notice that Paul not only does, of course, he distinguishes between Father, Son, and Spirit, but as he does so, he doesn't compromise that central tenet of monotheism. Mm -hmm. Rather, he can be, it, it's only, I, I, I like to imagine if you were, you know, sitting there on the receiving end of Paul's epistle, maybe you're a Hebrew, you would have been shocked, perhaps, by how strong his language is to identify Jesus as the one Lord. And mm -hmm. then in his second letter to the Corinthians, he'll do something similar uh, with, with the Spirit as well. And of course, I think it's right then to say, well, Paul is assuming that, yes, this is Father, Son, and Spirit, but this is the single, simple, one God we are stop talking about still. Um, have, do you, you know, let me throw it back to you. For, do you get that objection? Maybe it's in different forms, but do you ever get that type of objection? Well, well, I, t I do, and the objection that I get often um, now now this objection just comes from more as more from regular people, or or if they if they've read um, people like um, William Hasker or maybe William Lane Craig, or and and the real concern um, seems to be that um, that what has happened is that the divine persons, so the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the divine persons no longer are are personal <laughs> they, and be, when you believe in divine simplicity and and here's what people tell me is that they tell me look um if if say um at the transfiguration you know if they're the father um is known in his voice and the and the spirit um you know through and if the father says this is my beloved son well then the father must must have um, a distinct intellect, a distinct, um, in some way, a distinct will. Even though the will would be, would be united with that of the son and the spirit, but the father must at least have some distinct consciousness. In other words, how could mm -hmm. how could um, the father have any personal agency, if um, if the father um, and the son and the son were not different centers of consciousness? Oh. So so um, so in, in the world that. Uh, that, and that that's the phrase that I usually get in the in the world where um, that that I know is just this idea that idea that the divine persons are must be three centers of consciousness and and if so um, the problem there would be that then they would be three gods you know but and none of them would be really God but so tell me how do, how do, how do you I mean that's that's an objection I get I mean you probably get other objections but Anyway, that's one that I get, and I'd be curious, of course, what you think, or maybe if you yeah. have other objections that, that are more pressing. Yeah, no, I I have the same experience as you, uh, and when that objection comes, yeah, it, sometimes it's assumed, sometimes it's it's uh, just outright said that oh well, in order for the Trinity to truly be triune, mm -hmm. uh, these persons have to be individuals they have to be separate agents uh the language you use is very common in modern theology and contemporary theology even among some evangelicals who may use this language explicitly or maybe they don't use it but the way they talk seems to assume it where they the persons then become their own centers of consciousness and will which of course raises the issue of well then are there are there three wills in the trinity and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have a lot to, to say about this, but the, the rise in the, the last century, the 20th century in particular, of variant, variegated forms of uh, social Trinitarianism, some more 
maybe mm. some stronger than others, uh, has has pushed along these lines. And uh, I guess I would say a couple things in response. I, I'd love to hear your response, but a, a few things I would throw out there is, uh, first of all, I think it's important to, to be clear. I mean, you've done a lot of work on Augustine to be clear that when we compare, right, the pro-Nicene tradition, whether we're talking about the East, the, whether it's like Cappadocians in the East or Augustine in the West, mm -hmm. uh, this was not their line of argument. Um, they did not see the persons as their own individual centers of consciousness and will. Uh, they very much were uh, affirming divine simplicity. I know that the reason I, I bring that up is because uh, sometimes uh, the charge from certain quarters of social Trinitarian thought is, is that, well, yeah, that was a that was the fault of the West. That was a Western, mm -hmm. uh, they blame the West, especially Augustine, right? They really like to blame Augustine. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and then they'll say, but in the East, uh, they focused on the three persons, to which I, I like to introduce them to our good friend, Athanasius, <laughs> mm -hmm. and the Cappadocians as well, who actually have quite a bit to say about divine simplicity and go so far to argue that, let's take the, the sun, for example, when they're talking about the sun being begotten, yes, this is that eternal relation of origin that distinguishes the sun, but they are very quick to then qualify and say, at the same time, uh, this is perfectly consistent with the simplicity of this triune God, the Son is begotten from the Father's essence, says Athanasius. And he likes to say it again and again and again. Um, all that to say, I think sometimes we, you know, we come back to the Fathers and we, we sometimes overlook what, what everything they may be saying in order to, to you know, stress uh, something mm -hmm. like individual centers of consciousness and will. I, the, I'll, I'll throw this back at you, but one other thing, I'll just mention is that uh, it does raise the question if the Father, Son, Spirit have their own wills or their own centers of consciousness, or at the very, it, I hear this oftentimes among evangelicals, where they will talk in a way as if the persons could even work apart from each other, uh, exclusive from one another, or, or perhaps the Father works unilaterally, he doesn't even need the sun that mm -hmm. whatever it is that type of language and mentality i think can be quite dangerous because it then it, it it then fails to see that this sun is um a, a subsistence of the same divine essence um mm -hmm. and so if we talk that way we actually risk kind of ripping apart the persons as if the essence is something over here and the persons is something quite different entirely. But, but I'd love to hear your response. I, I, I'm really um, grateful for your book. And, and I think that how you respond to it in the book is, is and how you've just responded is very uh, rich. You know, and so I, I don't think I can, I, I can't, this in a, in a short statement, I wouldn't be able to uh, offer the riches of, of, of your book. I'd recommend people to read the book. But then um, one thing that I always worry about is, is I worry that um, Christians uh, can have a tendency to, to rip apart the, um, the scriptures. So I think we got to really keep, keep a hold of the unity of the scriptures and by, by this, I mean that, that there is the revelation of, of God and, and just the absolute, the absolute oneness of God, of, of the creator God. And, and that, that's such a rich part and a crucial part of the, of the whole Old Testament. And so, and so then, and of course, that's affirmed in the New Testament very strongly, that God is one and that God is perfect and, and so on. And, and, so, and so the thing is, the thing is, though, that if you have three gods... Then, um, then none of those gods would, would be um, I am. They, they would always be, they would be I, I 
am a center of consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> they, they wouldn't be I am. They'd be a limited. They'd be a limited mode of I am. They'd be I am a center of consciousness, and then I I am with these other two centers of consciousness. <laughs> you you yeah. see what I'm saying? Yep. So they'd be three I ams, but they would none of them would be the I am because none of because each of them would be a limited form of I am. You know, they they would not be. They would not be the God of it, of Israel as it's been revealed in the whole Old Testament. I mean, when I, when I say the whole Old Testament, I mean the Old Testament taken as a whole and read in Christ, read through the New Testament. So there would be a great a great ripping apart of the um, the scriptures, and then and and then there would also be as I as I see it, there there would also the second problem um, with the attack upon divine simplicity. Would be that that there would be a reduction of the mystery of of the I am mm. when Jesus speaks of his Father and then of the Spirit that he's going to send the yeah. the Advocate, you know, because in other words, Jesus is revealing to us a profound mystery. He's not revealing to us that hey, um, there's actually three I am's, three um, distinct centers of consciousness, and and they're like three people up in the sky. <laughs> You know, so Jesus, when Jesus reveals his father and that he is the word of God, the mm -hmm. word, that, that ought to give us a hint that the word of God, the person, the second person of the Trinity is, is the word, the logos. But that's not like three people up in the sky, you know, with each kind of thinking their thoughts. Yeah. You know, it's, um, the word, word indicates that there's a mystery here, a mystery of divine communion but not not something that we can sort of like easily say. Oh, it's like three three guys hanging out. And you you do this so well in, in your book, I think. So I'm I'm um, I know I'm preaching the choir here for sure. But those two elements, I think, those two elements. First of all, the unity of the of the um, old and new testament, and the in, the absolute crucial uh, insistence upon the the oneness of God in that in that sense. Not that God is one thing. God God is not. God's not like some numerical thing that he's, God's not one thing among other things, but God is absolutely, I am absolutely simple. That's what, that's what is revealed in the old Testament. God's not a one thing among a bunch of other things, but he's, he's the, I am the, the yeah. infinite plenitude, the source of all being the creator, you know? And so then that's the first point. But then the second point is that I do feel that there's a danger of, of really reducing the, the mystery of divine revelation in the New Testament. Yeah. When we think, oh, Jesus come, he, he's come just to reveal that there's actually three three people up there. <laughs> yeah. You know, or something like that. Three, three divine folk. <laughs> but but his relationship with the Father is nothing like that because because we know that one of the things we know about him is that Jesus is the word. And so that ought to just right there. You know, it's like that's not like that's not like mom, dad, and and child or something. Yeah. That's not like three leaf clover. Yeah, you know the word. You know, have you ever met a person who is just the word? Yeah, <laughs> you see. So there's a deep mystery here, and we got to keep that uh, um, keep that mystery right at the heart of our faith because that's part of as part of divine revelation. That's part of our holy scripture. I mean, that's a crucial part of our faith. Yeah, yeah. I can't help but you know think of uh, that statement that Jesus made, right? In which, mm -hmm. uh, well, it almost it almost led to his his death sooner rather than later when he, he makes that uh, bold claim that I and the father are one. And he seems, I think, I think, you know, when John uses the, the label word there is, we know, right. From the opening of his gospel, whether it's John or Jesus, they, they seem to mean something beyond. Uh, well, let me put it this way we would not feel comfortable saying that the way Jesus said that. Um, mm -hmm. that, that would be problematic. Um, the way he is referring to his oneness with the Father, well, this is a, an eternal unity um, and one in which, yes, he is the son, but he's the son from the Father. And, mm -hmm. you know, to introduce some of our our nicing vocabulary we could we could even say um he is a a subsisting relation 
um, not in the, the modern sense of relationships, uh, that would go more along the lines of what you warned about, you know, what these individual centers of consciousness, um, but rather he's, he's a subsistence of the same essence as the father. That, you know, wh whether it's that statement or, you know, I, I was thinking earlier of Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, when he says, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God. And then what he says next is, is really astounding, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. I, I think, to your point, John uses similar language when talking about the word. Paul seems to even pick up on that when he talks about how the cosmos were brought into existence. The Father... There never was a time when the father was without his word. So that, that I think that certainly changes how we, or at least it guards us from, from some of those mistakes. You know, maybe I could um, bring up uh, an, another one here, uh, especially given all the work you've done on Augustine. Uh, Augustine seems to be onto this way before us, right? Um, when he starts to warn in his book on the Trinity, he starts to warn against all the, the terrible ways <laughs> we might describe God as Trinity, analogies. We might describe God as Trinity that would somehow compromise the simplicity of this Trinity. And so Augustine is wanting to say, these persons are not parts that, that com uh, compose God or compound God. Now, I'm, I, I'm going to just list some of these. They're, 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 own, they're intellectually fun to, to think about, uh, but to guard ourselves from some of the, these are just some of the ones he mentions. He says, these are the, these are analogies. Augustine is saying, don't go here. He's saying uh, three friends, common friendship, three neighbors, common neighborhood, three relatives, common family, three statues, common gold, three species of one being three men, one manhood. And mm -hmm. I suppose we could we could keep going and add to that list, especially I, I, you've probably had this experience in in the church where someone will come up to you and say, "Hey, what about this? What about this analogy?" <laughs> and uh, I'm immediately hesitant because almost all of them have some type of fatal flaw. Um, but let's just maybe, maybe to just play along with Augustine here. Let's just take one of them: uh, three statues one gold. Um, Augustine has a lot to say about this one. What, why, why is it that this just falls apart? Uh, well, you, you could answer by me, but I mean, I would think, I think that it's one of the important biblical texts for Augustine, and this also would be from the Gospel of John, where Jesus says that God is spirit, and you know we're gonna need to worship him in spirit and truth. <laughs> so so right there, see for Augustine, that's just right there. Um, and that's of course in John four, I, I believe. <laughs> and then then John eight, you know where where Jesus says, um, uh, before Abraham uh, was, I am. But so this this sense of spirit of of that God is spirit. So Augustine then is not really inclined to to look for analogies that that have any serious weight you know he would um that are that are not analogies uh, rooted in spirit you know in other words like if the if the analogy is um material hmm. or if the analogy is in some way um already a finite a limited reality not 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 the pure i am you know, I, I am being this simple being, simple um, to be, you know, um, unlimited. You know, so I guess Augustine is any, anything that anything that is not spirit. He's he's not going to go down that path for um, for um, constructing an, an analogy because he wants to be faithful to divine revelation. You know, which teaches us that, that God is spirit. Yeah. I it's, it's such an important point, isn't it? Because we tend to think in very material, uh, 
category, mm -hmm. which can be dangerous if we if we start projecting that, you know, back onto back onto the Trinity, um, mm -hmm. and forget that, you know, those words from from the Old Testament, um, Deuteronomy, in which it's very clear that no, this is the God who has no form, and so that puts him altogether in, in a totally different category than than anything created or anything creaturely. Um, I thought, you know, to come piggyback on what you've said there, when, it, when Augustine starts to talk about why these analogies won't work, um, one of the things he points out, um, I, I think it's first Corinthians two, where he mentions this. Um, he, he goes on to say that um, when we talk about father and son, Together, we, we don't mean that together, um, father and son together are, are not more being than father alone or, or son alone. So he's trying to get away from that thinking like we're parceling out the person somehow. And then he goes on to say, but those three substances or persons together, if that is what they must be called, are equal to each one singly. Uh, he, was, he uses that, that word singly there. And then he says, which the sensual man does not perceive. A bit of a, of a punch. <laughs> um, it, it, seems, it seems like the, the point he keeps coming back to is, well, if, uh, if God is spirit, then um, we, we can't then look at any one person. Uh, Gregory makes this point, right? We as soon as we, mm -hmm. we we consider one person, we're drawn we're drawn to the three and, and to their oneness. Well, Augustine seems to make this in, in his own way when he uses that word singly to to specify that uh, it's not like we're we're adding up these persons. And I guess that's where the some of these analogies would fall apart, right? When we're talking about a a statue or three statues, and we say, oh, well, they've all got the same gold or something like that. Well. Uh, that doesn't really work because um, you take one of those statues and that's actually what one third <laughs> of the gold. Mm -hmm. That's disastrous if we start thinking of the Trinity that way. Um, that mm -hmm. certainly would would spell the death of of divine simplicity itself. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, of course. Um, I, maybe maybe you could help us a little bit here because. Um, for some of our viewers, they might uh, hear a word thrown around like quaternity um, as something we should avoid. Um, you've written a book on Augustine. How, how do you think Augustine avoids that danger of, of ending up with a quaternity? Oh, I, I see. Well, you know, there the, um, it's all, it's all it's all sort of complicated, you know, when you start to, um, Augustine's way of thinking about this is to begin with the, the, the and I think you, you know this very well, um, but he begins with the fact that, that um, what he takes from the prophets, that, that God is not like us. <laughs> you know, um, God, God is simply not like man. You know, and now in some ways, man is the image of God, but that doesn't mean that God is is like man. And so then Augustine, um, he's going to, um, you know, going to move and and as he thinks, he's going to keep that keep that profound unlikeness that that man is the image of God, but God's not the image of man. You know, so there's a certain unlikeness, and so he's going to really um, attend to that. And and one aspect of the unlikeness is this mystery of of the divine um, I am, the mystery of the divine nature or the divine, the divine being. Mm. And so Augustine is, you know, he, one of the, the key element of this mystery is that, um, you know, the divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they simply are God. And so there is no, you know, when you, when you kind of think about it, there's, there's no divine essence that is not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, there just there is no such as it were. Sometimes people people try to think, well, 
maybe the the divine essence in the father relates to the divine essence in the son they start to think of divine essence as like a bit of of clay oh, <laughs> or something yeah. or something or they think of divine essence as as kind of a bit of something yeah and they say well the divine essence in the father you know and whether that's intellect or whatever it is must relate to the divine essence in the son and so then the divine essence becomes sort of the principle of relation but see, all this is complete nonsense. Augustine would never, he doesn't think like this because mm. the divine essence is just simply who, who the Father is, who the Son is, and who the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are. You know, so that's right there. We're, we're, we're dealing with something then that is, is very difficult to conceive and impossible to imagine. You know, um, we, that's, why, that's why it's the mystery of um, the Trinity. That's why... That's why um, this communion uh, is something is going to be something greater than we can than we can conceive, yeah. because we're going to really enter into um, to the the mystery of the I am who is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, um, but without um, some sort of division. Yeah. Anyway, we I want I want you to talk about it because I think you can make it. You yeah. you have a way of writing about it that's so much more clear than than my my way of insisting that that look this is a mystery. Well, I, I agree with you. I think that it's absolutely crucial that we preserve the, the mystery of the Trinity. And, and this is often, when even historically, when we look back at uh, certain Trinitarian or even Christological heresies, mm. we start to sense things go off the tracks when this respect for the mystery of the Trinity is no longer uh, valued or, or no longer comes through in the way they read the Bible. Mm -hmm. I think this was a major issue with someone like Arius, but then also those um, other Trinitarian and, and Christological heresies that, that came later, uh, there, there wasn't a sense of reverence for the mystery of the Trinity. Instead, they came to the text in a almost a rationalistic way mm -hmm. uh, a literalistic way even uh, so that they would apply or attribute uh, concepts that might be familiar to our experience uh, straight back onto God and and then from there think well these are the implications I mean just to take one example of this, mm -hmm. When we talk about uh, a doctrine like eternal generation, that word eternal is so crucial because, yes, we're, we're using a word like generation or begetting that we are somewhat familiar with in our human experience. And so the, the metaphor is it, con it conveys something true to us that a, a son is from, the, from his father. But we have to be if we become literalistic or even rationalistic and insist that, well, we have to in, interpret this uh, in, in a, a very flat way, well, we quickly end up in some type of subordinationism um, mm -hmm. or some type of hierarchy um, or worse, because we can't, we, 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 we forget, well, wait a minute, this is the infinite eternal son we are talking about. He is from his father's essence from eternity. Um, you know, to use your language about the word, um, the, there, never there never was a time when the father was without his word, or we could say wisdom. There never was a time when the father was without his wisdom. Um, so this, this emphasis on the simplicity of the Trinity is crucial uh, because it actually protects that mystery that would if we if we get rid of it if, if it's if it's just vanquished then we actually then start interpreting the text in a way that is is not very Christian at all. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one maybe we could we could even you know transition to another objection. Maybe you you've experienced this as, as well, but uh, sometimes those who affirm divine simplicity and as as something that's crucial for understanding the Trinity, uh, sometimes the accusation is, oh, 
that's Sibelian, that's modalistic. Uh, you're, you can't, if you affirm simplicity, then you can't, um, you, surely you can't then dis distinguish between the persons. You kind of hinted at this at the start uh, with, I think you mentioned Hasker or uh, Craig and, and, and many others. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to, I'd love to hear, you know, how, how you respond to that. I, again, I, I don't know that my response is really any different than before. Uh, one, it's a bit of a his, it, historical oddity to make that charge. Um, because when you look at the way the Trinity has been defended, it's always within the, the boundaries of divine simplicity. So it's a bit odd. Um, but I guess more to the to the point when we're talking about um, the Trinity and the distinctions with you know Father, Son, Spirit, we're not talking about impersonal modes. Uh, we're, we're we're talking about modes of subsistence, if we can use that phrase, that um, are are well, for for lack of a better word, they are very very much personal. Um, in other words, the one essence isn't, it's not as if the one essence is manifested in merely three different ways uh, or forms or revelations as if, the, the, you know, at one point God decides I'm going to reveal myself at this point as son. And then he, then later, okay, now I'm going to reveal myself as spirit. Uh, rather the one, we, maybe we can put it this way, the one essence um, eternally, uh, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy subsists in three undivided uh, yet distinct persons. Um, each person yeah. being a subsistence of that one simple uh, indivisible essence. It's hard to even, mm -hmm. right, we're grasping for words at this point. I, I mean, how, how do you um, respond to that type of objection when someone says, oh, levering, he holds this simplicity. Uh, he, he, he's just turned into a civilian. <laughs> yeah, right, right. That is, that is a problem. Uh, you know, it can, it can be at least. Well, the, you know, the, the, whole, the whole thing begins, again, with the, that meditation on God, God as spirit, you know, and then the fact that, um, of course, divine spirit is, is not, like, not like human, um, even though, of course, we're, we're in the image of God. But but so how, how Augustine handles all this is he just says, look, let's let's begin with what's what's been revealed to us about how to understand this, um, you know, the three per the three per Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and so he just says, look, um, we we receive the name Word, you know, that's that's the name of the of the Son, and that God has revealed that to us, so let's um let's try to try to see then what. What um what what could differentiate a word from the begetter of the word, or what you know, in other words, from the father? You know, how do we how do we uh, you know how how is a word different from the father? And then Augustine, of course, when he thinks of divine essence, he just thinks of of I am, in other words, of of sheer, infinite, unrestricted, unlimited um to be. And so there, in in other words, we might we might need to really kind of reconceive things and just realize that. That they're almost you might need to think of it as you might not even think of a divine essence. Hmm. You know, um, there is no the truth of the matter is there is no one God that you sort of get up and it, unless unless by that one God you just simply mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit they they simply are that one God, and so there's no there's no one there's no sort of one core. We, we tend to think of it as like, um, you know, like a, a big sort of core, like a big energy, um, like they're like they have some energy uh, um, thing, like a big, a big um, buzz or something. And then then each of them are like little blips on the energy or something. But there is no there is nothing like that. There's yeah. nothing. And so how then do we think about spirit? Well, Augustine says, let's let's begin just by thinking about um, human spirit. And by that, he just means our, um, our own um, interiority, our own um, conscious um, knowing and loving. 
you know, that in the ways in which that we, um, you know, that we go beyond just mere um, material, we have a certain freedom, you know, we have, so, we have an amazing freedom from materiality and that we can, we can think, think of every, anything. I can think of my grandma, you know, and then I can think of the cosmos, <laughs> you know, I, I have this amazing, I have this amazing freedom and, and that's, um, that's intellect. You know, and then I also have this um, this amazing um, power of love. You know, where where love is a is a free a free act. You know, and and it reaches out to the good and embraces it. And I can reach out to the whole cosmos or to or to God Himself. Or you know, I can know I can know God Himself. And um, you know, and and by by know I mean I can speak true things like God God is. <laughs> Or God is good, you know. So I can know these things, and I can reach out to, to God and, and to my grandma and to and to all sorts of things. Anyway, so Augustine begins like that. He begins by saying, you know, look, if you want to understand spiritual realities that have been revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures, um, if you want to understand that God is Spirit and that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, um, then let's be let's try to do that. Then by remembering that we, even though God's not in the God's not the image of us, but we're the image of God. So let's go into that um, interiority, that mystery of freedom, and that mystery of um, love, and that mystery of of, of intellectual uh, power that enables us to generate a word. In other words, like I just generate the idea of the word, the inner word, Grandma, or the inner word, God, you know, and and so on. And so Augustine invites us um, to have a spiritual life. You know, if we want to understand what Jesus is saying, we want to worship him in spirit and truth. If we want to worship the one who before Abraham was, I am. Well, let's, um, you know, let's kind of remember, hey, this is, this is God we're talking about. This is holy ground. Let's take off our sandals and let's, let's have a spiritual life. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. that's Augustine's, that's what he basically says is, um, and then once we do that, once we do that, we're going to see that the, the word is distinct from the father. Now, now the agency of the word, the word and the Father, um, while they are, they're united at extra. You know, in other words, they're they're completely one in their agency, in their act, their act, but but they're not one in relation to each other. And so then we might say, well, we might say, but um, but how are they related to each other? We want to like, do they sit around and have a conversation? <laughs> you know, well. That's, you know what, um, that's what the beatific vision is for, <laughs> for Augustine, for Augustine, we got to, um, we got to, you know, we're going to share deeper, we're going to know as we are known, but, um, but that we're going to see face to face, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we're going to know God as, as, as he knows us, but, and we can get a foretaste of that, we can even now if we have a spiritual life. Yeah. And we are, and Jesus calls us to that. He calls us to, um, to that. Um, he, he calls us, first of all, to know him as savior yeah. and to know um, that we are, we are adopted sons and we will share in his inheritance. Mm. Um, but part of his, part of his inheritance is that he knows the father and we can, we can begin to know the father in him if we have a spiritual life, you know, but it, it's going to be the bit of vision where we really understand how it is that word and Holy Spirit, um, since they, they they don't differ in the ways that we want them to differ. We want them to differ um, by like sitting around and having a conversation. <laughs> you know, we're three guys, three guys and um, sharing one stool or something. <laughs> anyway, okay, but I I talk too much. You're, I think your book proves that you're you're the one that um, knows that you didn't. I'm the, I'm the one supposed to be interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I do want to say this about your comment just now. Um, I think I, when I wrote Simply Trinity, mm -hmm. uh, by the time I finished with it, I thought, goodness, there really needs to almost be, it, it felt so incomplete because there, there almost needs to be hundreds and hundreds of more pages spelling out implications like you said for then uh our spiritual life or our christian life our our fellowship and communion with this trinity and one of the things that is i i found just throughout 
my own research is as I was reading the scriptures and then also reading the fathers as they read the scriptures mm -hmm. and just kind of circling around that process, I realized so many times that, well, I, I just wanted to pray and at times mm -hmm. wanted to worship because I thought if this, if this really is the triune God, then um, understanding, like you said, not only his, uh, the indivisibility of his works at extra uh, in the economy of salvation, well, that not only is, is uh, something that brings out gratitude in me that this Father, Son, and Spirit, this one God has saved me, uh, but it also then leads me to want to contemplate further who this triune God is in and of himself at intra. And so I certainly resonate uh, with what you said. I, I think it, it's a reminder, right, that uh, when, yes, we may be talking about some deep things of God, but it's never removed from uh, prayer and worship and our spiritual life uh, yeah. because it, it's completely dependent on on whether we we know this this trinity in fact um, that's exactly it because and augustine augustine says that that the more our our spirit our souls or our spirit our spiritual um you know dimension the our knowing and loving i mean the more our knowing and loving are caught up in in the divine generation of the word and the divine um spiration of the spirit in other words more that our knowing and loving are caught up in that in that divine mystery of trinity um the more that we're going to know you know who who this father son and holy spirit is we're going to know him as we are purified as we actually love as we actually um contemplate God interiorly, you know, um, in prayer and spiritual life. And that that's part of theology. So Augustine invites us, he invites us um, to a deeper um, understanding of theology. You know, theology is not just simply um, kind of, kind of saying, hey, um, hey, the, um, Jesus, Jesus come to tell us that there's three guys in the sky, you know, and, and hooray, <laughs> you know, I mean, because <laughs> that, that would, that would, uh, that would, that would imply that Jesus was not, not a Jew. I mean, Jesus believed in, in one, it, Jesus knew, of course, he didn't believe, he knew one God, yeah. but of course that one God is Father, Son, and Spirit, but he was, he wasn't, he didn't come to, <laughs> To tell us that that somehow there's three guys in the sky or whatever, you know, he came to help us worship in yeah. in spirit and truth. And if and when we read Saint Paul and when we read, um, you know, of course, the Book of Revelation and yeah. and so on, we we know that it's we need to begin to purify. Uh, yeah. And by by purifying, I I simply mean um, something we beg God for the grace. We just beg God for the grace to um to make us people who actually love and who who desire that contemplation, yeah. who have that desire for God. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, I think that's for divine things that desire for God. And, and a lot of people, a lot of people have a deep desire for, for God. It's very beautiful, really. So, so think, since you mentioned the, the three guys in the sky, uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to, I have to admit that uh, I'm going to have to use that with some of my students now to test them on, on <laughs> whether, whether they understand the Trinity correctly or not, but uh, maybe on in light of that, I mean, you you are not necessarily, and you know, we operate in different circles. Is uh, you sort of look on in at the evangelical circle um, when you come across uh, kind of more recent. Uh, uh, arguments. Um, you think, for example, of um, I would even call them novel. Think, for okay. example, of more recently uh, EFS or um, the eternal, those who argue for the eternal uh, subordination or functional subordination of the Son and the Father. 
Uh, mm. Some of them have, have used language that we've warned about even in our own conversation, right? They'll speak mm. of the imminent Trinity in terms of a society. And then when they talk about the persons, they talk about roles. Um, so they're not necessarily using some of that, the language that we've referred to. And then when they talk about the imminent life of God, uh, they want, even when, even if they acknowledge something like eternal generation, they still want to say, well, the person of the son is defined by his uh, subordination, even if it's a functional subordination to the father. Mm -hmm. I would, I would be curious, you know, is we've been sort of warning against different, um, you know, different missteps as you sort of look, look in at evangel mm -hmm. some, some evangelicals who are going that direction, what would, how would you caution evangelicalism as a whole um, against that sort of move of hierarchy? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I love that evangelicalism, though, is so is really spiritually vibrant. And, and there's so much, there's so much uh, love of the Lord, and, and then a desire to hear his, his word. You know, so I, I think it's very beautiful. Um, now, in terms of in terms of your question, well, that's, oftentimes, it's the individual, there's, there's just a sense, there's a, there's a sense that they, people, when I talk to people, they say, but surely Jesus Christ reveals something about the Son. You, you see, he's, and so therefore, with Jesus Christ, he dies on a cross, and he, he dies in obedience to his Father. And so they say, um, well, he must be revealing that he, um, when he obeys the Father's will, he must be re revealing sort of an, an eternal, um, some mysterious eternal sub subordination or eternal mm -hmm. obedience you know, um, to, to the father. And so, and so that's, I mean, you can see really what, uh, where they're coming from, right. You know, I mean, they, they want, they desperately want the, um, the son to, and Jesus Christ, you know, to, to be important. And, and I would really want to assure them <laughs> that Jesus Christ, as he reveals the perfect wisdom and the perfect love of the father, because he's the perfect image of the Father, because he's he is the Word of the Father, and the Word of the Father is is a word of wisdom, a word of mercy, um, you know, a, a creative word, uh, all sorts of things. Um, so he Jesus reveals the Father, but he he doesn't reveal the Father in a way that that contradicts um, Scripture. <laughs> you know, I mean that's that's the bottom line that you got to keep in mind that the Father. And, and Jesus are in their eternal, um, you know, mystery. Jesus is the absolute image of the Father, the abs the ab and the perfect image of the Father. That and so that doesn't that if he if he were um, obedient to the Father in this subordinated sense, he would not really be the perfect image of the Father. <laughs> yeah. He would not. He would. That's the problem. And so he nor would he really be the perfect word or expression of the Father he would be a subordinated word, <laughs> you know, a, a word, a word is um, the fullness, he, the fullness of expressing the fullness of who the father is. He, the, in other words, the word is the perfect expression of the father. He is all that the father is. It, he's distinct from the father, but he's all that the father is. He perfectly images the father. But, but if he were some sort of lesser um, obedient sort, <laughs> Um, then he would not do that. And so we got to really um, hold on to scripture just as tightly as we can. And that's that's the value of these early Christian um, authors that you've explored in your book went so beautifully. And you've, um, the book, I think, is is a really important path for, for everyone to read. Um, you know, but you really explore how these early Christian writers are very deep readers of scripture and how it's, um, we need to remember that um, that they really had this, this deep, um, deep scriptural um, meditation that, of course, um, you know, is is part of our faith. We believe that that um, that their their reflection on the Holy Trinity. Um, you know, we believe in the Holy Trinity, <laughs> and so we're we're grateful to them. Yeah, you know what what you just said 
is is so crucial uh, that in or, in order for Jesus, when we talk about the eternal Son, right, in, in order for the Son to be the not just the image but the perfect image, right? Mm -hmm. But that's very Pauline language. The the perfect image of the Father. Well, then that that automatically then precludes uh, any any type of um, subordination that oh, yeah. would, that would compromise it. Um, I can't help you know since you you finished there talking about um, the way that the patristics uh, were so careful on, on this very issue. Uh, I can't help but think of the Athanasian Creed and and perhaps we can we can uh, wrap you know bring things to a finish this way. Um, I have it here in front of me. So I, I just want to, to, to share maybe a line. The, the poet in me uh, just can't help myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> at one point, you know, it, it, and to our, our viewers, if you've never read, I mean, just Google it. If you've never read the Athanasian Creed, you're missing out. It's so rich. Um, but one of the things, one of the things that says uh, as it's talking about uncreated, infinite, eternal, and almighty, it says in the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Spirit almighty. And then when it, when it goes on, it, it then says they, they are not three almighties, but one, one almighty. That yeah. is just so beautiful. That seems to just be the right, caution but also almost a celebration of the type of simplicity that you know you and i are, are trying to get at but i do yeah. i i do have have want to uh i i know we've been talking about me and, and but i want to i do want to mention one thing about you uh for the for the sake of our um our our viewers and our readership is uh, if you, if, if those watching, if you haven't picked up uh, one of Matthew Levering's books, I would, I mean, there's so many to go with, but um, I would really recommend, you know, we've mentioned Augustine from time to time. I would really recommend his book on Augustine's doctrine of the Trinity. So rich. And, um, and then go read Augustine for yourself, of course. Yeah, that's it. I think that's the answer. Is just read Augustine, you know, <laughs> read, read, read De Trinitate. That's right. You know, read, and especially, especially like read the later books of the De Trinitate um, after you've read Confessions. <laughs> that's right. Confessions that's first. Right. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But then, and, um, and then, then read, read, read this book. <laughs> you know, this book after that. You know, because this. You have a beautiful poetic style, and you—I can see that you are—you have a sort of gift for narrative. You have a gift for telling stories, and and then you also have that that um, that gift for thinking very deeply about um, the realities of our faith. Well, I, I am a bit of a storyteller. I I, I will confess, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard not to get wrapped up in a good story, and uh, so I I feel like hey if. If we can um, bring theology to life uh, uh, through our own story, and and uh, well, it, it, it's all the better. But um, you mentioned I'll, I'll let you go. I, I know that um, we probably need to get on with our day here. But uh, you mentioned before we we got on the recording here that uh, you have uh, I think a son where I am in Kansas City. And you, I think you said, I think you said something about Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. Um, yeah, yeah, I love Mahomes. <laughs> is Matt, is Matt, I, so this is this is the the most important question that we could we could answer, right? Is whether Matthew Levering uh, has any inclination towards Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs? <laughs> uh, I, love, I love Mahomes. I, I do really. Yeah, but, uh, absolutely. Kansas City. You're in a good place. You you are, yeah. So um, remember, they uh, Chicago Bears could have drafted Mahomes, but oh. instead, instead Kansas City got him, and so there must be some divine purposes 
<laughs> Maybe we all need to move to Kansas City. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's just uh, God's providence, I suppose. But um, well, I'm glad we got it on record. Uh, a, a kindred football spirit, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Matthew, it's been it's been really good getting to to talk like this. I hope. Hey, thank you. Hope thank we you for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I hope we could do it again. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Wonderful.